Well, Justin, we're back. We're kicking off, uh, continuing this series here on pursuing a better investment experience, just trying to go through some of the nuts and bolts and and really what are some of the, the real foundational principles to investing in probably the most responsible way is certainly within the public markets. We've, we've tapped into the private markets a little bit, but really spending this series mostly on the public markets. And we're going to stick with that today. You know, last week we really harped on, you know, really letting the market work for you, not trying to get too cute and predict things one way or the other. Um, And today we're going to, you know, dig a little deeper there. Uh, We're going to go into considering what are the actual drivers of returns in the market and maybe how can you use that information to your advantage? You know, I'd love to start off by saying, you know, uh, let's just start with the, the simple statement that, for for many investors, a well diversified total market approach is a really great portfolio. Totally, uh, it is low cost, tax efficient, uh, low turnover. There there are so many things to love about just a well diversified, simple passive portfolio. However, there is you know, a better way to invest in our opinion. And it's really rooted in academic research. And when we start to talk about this, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about something called factors um, and really getting into that. And this is definitely, uh, we're going to spend a lot of the conversation over here on the other side of the table. We're going to let the uh, the CFA uh, <laughs> dig into this for the most part. We're going to try not to, I've warned him not to get too far into the weeds here. If you want to get into the weeds, you know how to contact us, give us a text, give us a call. Uh, if you want the text number, we'll go off the top here. Shoot us six, yeah, 602-704-5574. If you want to get in the weeds, I'll get that text over to Justin. He'll get back to you. But <laughs> You know, w- let's keep it high level. What are we What are we talking about here, Justin? When we talk about factors and how can they benefit? You know, maybe add a little bit on top of this uh, this well diversified approach. Sure thing. And and I'll, let me even uh, piggyback on what you said around a broadly diversified um, approach or index based approach. I think that really is it's the epitome of of letting the market work for you. So it it really dovetails nicely into what we've been talking about over the last couple episodes. Uh, but getting in under the, under the hood, if you will, or, or digging deeper, and I'll, I'll really try my best uh, to to keep things high level here, to thinking about drivers of returns. So you look at the broad market, you look at that broad index based approach, and that is good. That's an excellent place to start. However, there is a lot, as as you mentioned, there's a lot of academic research, and and this research continues on an, on a on a regular basis to to. Try and look under the hood. I mentioned that statement not too long ago, but to divide the the market up into certain characteristics or what what are called factors. We mentioned that term to say, okay, are there discernible characteristics or or these factors or or qualities of uh, of companies of of a aggregate group of companies that stand out, that act differently, that perform differently than the market as a whole? And the short answer, and we'll get into what these factors are, the short answer is yes, the academic data, the research at the end of the day shows in a very rigorous way that there are parts of the market that perform differently. There are parts of the market that underperform the general index. There are parts of the market that outperform the general index. This isn't consistently on an annual basis. This is over very long periods of time, a great amount of discipline and actually figuring out, can you get exposure to those factors in a, in a cost-effective way? All of that matters. Uh, and, and so that's just a quick teaser. Again, we'll get into exactly what these factors are, but, and we've talked on, uh, we've, t- we've touched on them. Excuse me. We've touched on them time and time again, right? These things are size, the size of the company, big companies versus small companies, the valuation of a company. Are they a high growth company? Are you paying a substantial premium for current and or future expected earnings that, or are you paying a discount? Is it a profitable company? Is it an unprofitable company? These are the the three big factors that we'll we'll dig into. I think that's a great point. When we start to look at this, right, rather than looking at individual stocks or individual bonds and should we buy these and predict markets, I think we beat that dead horse. That doesn't work. 
But what really what you should be doing is like Justin just hit on is looking at grouping of these companies and saying, you know, what are the similar characteristics? And you start to look at it and, and size is a similar characteristic, right? You group larger companies together, you group smaller companies together, you know, value is a characteristic. You start to group that together or, or growth is a characteristic. You start to grow group that together. And really what started to, you know, through the academic research uh, became available is when they started to group these stocks and these bonds together, it became really evident over long periods of time that these factors actually do show up in a very persistent way. And I think that's one thing to really hit on is that for a factor to be investable or, or to be really be valid, right? It's got to be sensible. It's got to be backed by data. You know, it can't be an opinion that we, you know, read the tea leaves this morning and think something's going to happen. Uh, and it has to, you know, be backed by that data over time across different markets, not only the U.S., but in the entire world. Right. It's got to it's got to go through different market cycles. Uh, and then it has to be actually cost effective to capture. That's the other big, the yeah. other big thing. We were actually with a, a prospective client yesterday and he works in the big uh, state run kind of government uh, programs, investment programs where they don't have to worry about taxes. And so it's a totally different implementation, right? Like some of the strategies they may look at it don't work in the tax world. So anyways, it's got to be cost effective to actually implement these things. Uh, but what ends up showing up or you've already hit on them, Justin, at least on the public equity side is it's going to be, you know, the company size, it's going to be the relative price. So is it a value or is it a growth profitability? Maybe spend a little bit of time, just unpack for us. How, how do we group companies into those? What are some broad definitions of those? And, and what are, what have we actually seen from the data over time? Why does it make it useful to go get that? Yeah. Uh, well, let's start with company size. So Company size, the common term and definition to use is what's called market capitalization. Market capitalization is simply the number of shares that are outstanding. So you become a public company, you issue a, a certain number of shares, and it's actually really an arbitrary number. Um, but that's, that's an important factor or variable in this calculation. You take that number of shares, multiply it by the market price, and you get what's called market capitalization. That gives you the size of the company. A lot of times you'll you'll see this in the in the financial media where Apple became the world's largest company or the first trillion dollar market cap company. Those are mega cap companies. We're talking about the broad market. Those are those are are part of the market, but they're they're outliers. There's very few companies that really fall into that mega cap bucket. And so there's a whole laundry list below them of, of size of companies. And then if you rank them essentially from biggest to largest, and then look at the performance over long periods of time, the, the data that we have here to reference today goes all the way back to 1928. I mean, it's almost a hundred year period of time. And if you look at that on a, from a company size standpoint to answer your question directly, small companies. So think about that generally speaking as the bottom 10% usually. I mean, the definition can vary quite substantially depending on who you're talking to. But if you look at say the bottom 10% of, of companies based on market capitalization, they have outperformed by just under 2% over that nearly 100 year period of time since 1928 through the end of 2021. In actual uh, annualized performance numbers, that's 12.14% versus 10.19% or 10.2%, let's call it. So meaningful difference. And if you think about that as well from a, a compounding standpoint, so this is as, as, as nerdy or as, as geeky we'll get, compounding over long periods of time at a higher rate of return, even what you think of as relatively small small uh, differences, like a, a quarter of a percentage point, so 0.25%. If you compound two different returns, meaning you earn that over, over long periods of time on two different assets, a, a difference of 0.25%, you end up with substantially different values at the end of the day. And you start to see this over 10, 20, 30 year periods. You're, we're talking about almost 100 years here, and it's it's a meaningful difference in, in wealth. So um, that's on the company size standpoint. I'll touch on relative 
relative valuation or relative price. So valuation is what, what you're paying for future earnings of a company. That's really what the price kind of comes down to. You, you are paying when you're buying a stock, we've touched on this, there's a, there's a podcast about actually what a, a stock or what an equity is and, and what you get by owning a share of a company or a piece of a company. And really at the end of the day, what it is, is it's a stream or a claim on future earnings. And there's a, there's a price that people pay for that. Is it a high price? Is it a low price, right? The, that is what the market is trying to determine. And really relative price is basically saying all things being equal, let's look at the market and, and say, okay, a, a value company is a low relative price to future earnings. A growth company is a high relative price to future earnings. A lot of the big tech companies, just to put some context around this, a lot of the big tech companies, uh, especially early in their careers or early in their, their maturation, if you will, definitely fall into that growth bucket, still largely to do today. And a lot of the more you know, financial companies, banks, kind of tried and true industrials generally fall into more of a value oriented um, association. So that's a, a quick intro, uh, not quick, but a, an intro nonetheless into, into the, the two definitions there. Yeah. So, and when we start to think about that, Justin, one thing that always goes into my head and I think goes into a lot of clients' heads is 1928. That's a long time. I'm not investing for a hundred years. Uh, most hopefully most people for this podcast actually are if you think multi-generationally yeah, however let's assume that you're not that's still a really long period of time and you know does it break down into the to shorter periods of time the answer is yes but like you said it is a long-term game we may go there might be a five a ten year period where it underperforms yeah. but the persistence has continued to show up so you don't need just to be clear that full hundred years for this to show up this is something that does show up you know, more often than that. And oftentimes it will go through long periods of underperformance, but then it comes back in a massive way in a short period of time. Um, and so when we start to think about these things, cause I get this question a lot. Okay, great. You just nailed it. Okay. I get 2% from, uh, from company size, you know, going, going for small companies, relative price, those value companies versus growth have outperformed by 2.84% over that period of time. This is great. I've got five, an extra five percentage points annually. Why aren't we just a hundred percent small value? Uh, and I think it goes back to, uh, it goes back to the point I was just making earlier that there are periods of time where it doesn't always show up. It's kind of, I make the analogy to sports where, you know, there's a reason why in baseball right now, uh, there's a lot of stats that have showed that you're the, the two hole hitter actually gets more at bats, right? So you want to generally put one of your best hitters in the two spot so they get more at bats. It's very similar with your portfolio. You know, we want to make sure that we, now that that two hitter he isn't going to hit every single time. Right. He doesn't even get a hit That's at so eight important. out of 10, right? The best, you know, if you're Tim Anderson, you're getting a hit, you know, 3.3 times right. out of 10. <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do here is just put the odds in your favor. So we're, if you think the old ice, uh, old school ice tray, right? We got water in every cube that represents the entire market. All we're doing is we're tilting that that ice tray so a little bit more water flows into this area of small value and then the third factor of, of profitability. Uh, and when you do that, right, you start to overweight your exposure there to the places in the market that at least data tells us where we can expect higher returns. Right, right, right. And let, let's jump into profitability. And this one, it, it almost, it, it's almost like, well, duh, it makes plenty of sense, right? We're basically saying more profitable companies have a greater rate of return over the long term than less profitable companies. Anybody who understands business, which it, that's biz, basic business, like that just makes a ton of sense. But but it's off. It, it didn't actually come up in the academic research or the academic literature until somewhat recently. There's 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 a lot to it. Again, under the hood, and we're not going to go too much into the weeds around that that one. But there was a lot of questioning about what's actually driving that. Is it is it purely the profitability metrics of a company? Is there something else that that's really you know behind that uh, that greater rate of return? At the end of the day. 
the academic community basically said, yeah, th this is a true factor. Uh, uh, a more profitable company, again, or a group of companies generally outperforms less profitable company companies. And the, the, the cool thing, and just to hit on your, your comment, Brandon, too, around, hey, you don't need to be invested for nearly 100 years. Although, again, for a lot of our clients that, that we're working with, multi-generational wealth truly is a, a priority and a goal. And, and so thinking about it in terms of 100-year timeframes actually is relevant. But it's, a, it's an incredibly long period of time. There are periods of time where, where small caps underperform or value underperforms. That's definitely been the case of recent in the United States, um, most definitely. But the, the interplay or the combination of these three factors is really important to, to touch on, where you're getting the benefit of diversification. So maybe value doesn't perform as well as it has in the past, which it, it definitely has been the case, like I said. Well, but the small cap factor actually has done well in certain markets and has overcome or at least diminished the underperformance of value and then take profitability. Profitability has done very well uh, as of late. And so you, you get the, the interplay of these, these different factors within the portfolio working together to give you the benefit of diversification amongst them, but also still in an aggregate give you an, a higher expected return than the general market or the general index, which again is a great solution, but we actually can take the data and say, well, hey, there are ways to outperform like we're talking about here. Yeah, I think that's a great point to make. And and to be clear too, don't run out and just buy the first small value uh, fund that you see <laughs> because those aren't all created equal, oh, right? Yeah. There's the active versus the more index type approach. We're talking about the more index type approach. So just be careful there. Talk to your advisor before you run out and, and throw money into small value somewhere. Make sure you have the right small value manager that's taking this more indexed like approach uh, to, to small value. But I think, you know, to close this out, the beautiful thing about a factor-based approach really is that, you know, it's all about capturing returns that, you know, isn't reliant upon predicting stocks, predicting bonds, you know, which market areas is tech going to do well, is tech not going to do well, industrials, right? You don't have to play any of that game, but what you rather can do is you just, you're holding a well-diversified portfolio that's going to, over time, you know, back to the data, it's statistically going to provide better results for you. If you're emphasizing, you know, what are the, the true factors of higher, higher returns, expected returns, are you controlling costs and really focusing on the tax efficiency and low turnover? If you're doing that, you don't have to go play this game. That's not successful. Anyways, you can have the tried and true approach that's backed by data, backed by financial science. Uh, and it's just a really successful, great experience as an investor. So we're going to close out today. Hopefully this was helpful. Uh, but as I mentioned at the top, text us, uh, 602-704-5574. We want to hear from you guys. Um, but until next time, own your wealth, make an impact, and always be a pro. The information in this podcast is educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.